In your 20s, you were not really aware that you were a historical being. You don't, yeah. you don't think about that. You don't think you're the product of ages and ages of historical events. Uh, you live in the present and you look to, to the future. To the Harbour Grace excursion with double to have. It's really saved my life. One of the reasons that we're lucky enough to have Juan Gabriel Vasquez in Toronto on this snowy November evening um, <laughs> is that he's currently giving a series of lectures at Barnard College in New York called From Fiction to Lies, Literary Imagination in the Age of Post-Truth. Um, Juan, you said or you, at the beginning of one of, of your first lecture that you're obsessed with the breakup of the narrative contract. Yeah. Could you talk a little bit about that to yes. start with before we get to the shape of the roads? Yes, <laughs> that's a good idea. Thank you all for coming. Um, I'd like to thank the, the TPL for this invitation. It's always lovely to be in Toronto, where I have friends and translators and translators who are friends, the whole array. <laughs> How many translators do you have? <laughs> many, many, don't worry. Um, and thank you, and for doing this. And always makes my words a little better than they are. I hope you do the same thing today. <laughs> so, no, you're um, on your own so yeah, the breakup of the narrative contract is is one of the um, of the uh, topics these lectures that I'm giving try to tackle. Um, what I mean by that is is really it has nothing to do with fiction, but with the fact that we are human beings, we are storytelling animals. We are shaped by stories. Stories are the way we interpret life, we understand life. This is what we do during the whole day. What we do is tell stories about uh, each other, about ourselves. This is how we find our identity, stories. And this is how we receive the truth or the falsehood of the world by reading journalism, by reading fiction, um, by watching films, etc. What has happened in the last few years, I think, is that this sort of agreement that we had as societies, that we shared the same reality, we interpreted that reality different, if we are liberals or conservatives, we interpret it differently. If we are atheists or religious, if we come from different social backgrounds or have different religions, or we interpret that reality in a different way. But we all used to agree that there was such a thing as a common reality. This is no longer the case. Mm. Because of many things that have been going on lately, one of them is a new and incomprehensible phenomenon called social media. Um, we are facing this new situation in which we all get a reality that is tailored for us. Each individual gets a version of reality that is shaped by their prejudices, by their, um, uh, their convictions, obviously, their likes or dislikes, the things they buy mm. or don't buy online, um, the, the news they spend uh, time on or the country. Um, anyway, through a series of phenomena, we have blown up the whole idea of a common reality. There is no longer that. That is the breakup of the narrative contract. Um, I think it was Hegel who used to, who, who wrote in, in, in a very well-known um, but minor work. Um, he wrote that reading the paper in the morning is, I hope I'm saying this correctly, uh, is, Didn't say it in English is anyway, like, so. no, no. I, <laughs> I, I hope I'm remembering it correctly. 
Uh, reading the paper in the morning is uh, the, the place where the realist is like, like, the, like a religious ceremony, like a, like a religious ceremony for, for the secular man, for the realist man, by which he meant secular. Yeah. So reading, reading the paper in the morning is that place where we go into the, the, the shared reality with our fellow human beings. Yeah. This has no longer been the case for many years. The, this is no longer true. Yeah. And that worries me because yeah. it has, it has um, the situation has evolved in a very nasty way. And what I was reading in a, in a, in a, in a book by one of the founders of the, of the Internet of Virtual Reality, Jaron Lanier, oh, yeah. um, he was discussing in a book in which he he strongly recommends that we all close our social media. Um, he was saying that uh, it's, it's getting very difficult to feel empathy yeah. with our fellow human beings, towards our fellow human beings, because we never, through social media, we have been reduced to a place in which we never see the story of uh, the people we have next to us. Yeah. So they stop being part of our, our world, they stop being somebody we disagree with, they become the enemy because we don't see where their opinions come from because the reality they are giving opinions from uh, has been tailored yeah. for them. And there's no conversation, and there's they're no just conversation. judgment, they're just yeah. leaping yes. to judgment. Exactly. Um, this is, this is a, long, a series of three lectures which are quite long, so we can't really get into it. We can give them. If you have three hours, then we can. You might be able to read one of them in brick soon, yeah. well, in the first one. But um, let's get to the shape of the ruins, and yeah. maybe you could um, start with a bit of background about your particular, some of your particular obsessions. He has a lot of obsessions. Um, <laughs> um, Colombian history and politics and... Um, yeah. Certain assassinations, murders. Yeah, yes, of course. Well, it, it's, you make it sound like a bad thing. It's, uh, um, when, I, when I go to Bogota, Juan drags me around <laughs> to the sites where people were murdered, basically. This, yes. is what we, this is what he does for fun. Yes, yes, I do. Yeah. Um, well, I think this is one of the things the book tries to discuss is this relationship we have with the past, with that part of our past that we call history which is something that every country can relate to. I mean, every country has skeletons in their closets and, uh, and part of, of the self-imposed um, mission of the novel as a genre in every country is to try to clarify a little bit these dark places <coughs> of our past. <Yeah. coughs> and so, um, Colombian history history of violence, as no doubt you know, um, has shaped my fiction because there are questions there, or rather, there are places there that remain in the dark. There are important episodes in Colombian history about which we still don't know the truth, and they are violent episodes, murders, uh, political murders. Um, and so what happened to me, um, to discuss this book in particular, is that I grew up with legends and stories and um, versions of one of these political murders, the murder of a presidential candidate called Jorge Eliezer Gaitan in 1948. Colombians have been, have grown used uh, to thinking about the murder of Gaitan in the same terms of Americans think about the murder of Kennedy. It's this big national trauma in which we know who the, who the direct culprit is, we know who pulled the trigger, but we have all agreed over time that there's a, a hidden truth behind that. Um, and we have become obsessed, all of us, not only me. Uh, during the last 60 years. You more so than. Me more so, Some. yes. Um, about this, about the, the truth behind the, uh, the, the lies or the misinformations or the distortions that we have inherited about 
the crime of Jorge Elias Ergaitán. So uh, what happened to me was that after years and years of listening to these stories, because a, a, a relative of mine was an important politician when Gaitan was killed, so the, the, the legends uh, are part of my family. Um, what happened to me in 2005 is that uh, at the same time as my twin daughters were being born in Bogotá, I met this surgeon um, who had read a novel of mine in which I briefly discussed the crime of Jorge Eliezer Gaitan. And so he said to me, I have something to show you. I can show you something that nobody else can show you. And he invited me to his house. And there, he opened this drawer and he produced a vertebra that belonged to Jorge Eliezer Gaitan. <laughs> with the, the hole <laughs> of one of the bullets that killed him. And, you know, he, he uh, let me faint and recover. <laughs> and, uh, um, before he said, and I hear you're also interested in this other murder that shaped Colombian history at the beginning of the 20th century, <laughs> the murder of a congressman who was a military man veteran of several civil wars, called Rafael Uribe Uribe. Now, you all know Rafael Uribe Uribe. Even <laughs> if you don't know, you know him. Because he is the model Garcia Marquez, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, used to build the character of Aureliano Buendía in 100 Years of Solitude. Um, and so I said, yes, I'm interested in that guy, too. <laughs> As a matter of fact. <laughs> a, 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 little, a little apprehension, I must say. Oh, and no. so he opens another drawer, <laughs> <laughs> and, he, he, and he takes the top of a skull. The cranial vault. Thank you, translator. <laughs> no, I think okay. Cranial vault of Rafael Uribe Uribe. And so, obviously, at that moment, I knew, I, I had these bones in my hands, mind you. So at that moment, I knew I think at least two things. The first is that I had to write a novel about this. This is novel material. Um, and this was 14 years ago? This was 2005, yes. And the second thing was that I had to wash my hands before going back to my <laughs> daughters. Uh, but Because they were in incubators. They were in they were, incubators. They, were they had a very the premature were, yeah. birth, which is discussed in the novel yeah. because it was part of the, uh, part of the thing. Um, but the thing is, you have to imagine yourself in my position. I, I have in my hands the remains of, the, of two of the most important uh, uh, victims of political violence in my country, uh, whose murders shaped the history of my country and thus shaped my personal history. Um, and this is happening at the same time as my daughters are being born. So because I think like a novelist, <laughs> And really? I'm a little bit paranoid. <laughs> and obsessive. And obsessive. I think this is the history my daughters are inheriting. How do you protect someone who has just come into the world from a history of violence? If, if it's true, as I think it's true, that violence is transmitted from generation to generation, that the consequences of violence, political and public or private, if they come down uh, in history, is there a way I can protect these girls from that, from that heritage? Um, when this question took shape in my head, I thought I have to write a novel about this because the no I. I like novels that do this, that try to answer or explore these fundamental questions in which we meet <clears throat> our historical character, in yeah. which we realize that we, each one of us, is a, a product of history. Questions that don't actually have answers. Questions that don't actually have an answer, yes. Which is what novels do. Yes. So, um, so I want to 
ask you the answer to that question, because the novel is the answer to that question. Mm. Um, the novel is the answer to that. The novel tries to explore many things, I think, but um, one of them is how violence is inherited and how mm. we can protect uh, ourselves and our loved ones from a heritage of violence. Another one is um, about the secrets and the mysteries that, that the past holds, uh, the way we can never really know what happened in the past. Um, so storytelling is the only way we can try to penetrate a hidden past or a secret past or a mystery in the past and try to shed a little light on it. Also, in that same sense, the way history is written. The novel tries to explore how all these important things that happen to a country get told many times. Uh, there are official stories being told about them. There are unofficial stories. And there are these strange things, um, that are almost like a genre, in which when a society realizes that history has, lying, has lied uh, to us, has been lying to us, there's like a void. And immediately, other stories fill that void. You mean conspiracy, conspiracy theories? theories. <laughs> exactly. Sorry. Conspiracy theories, no. This is, I could ask you questions about the, <laughs> that novel. No. <laughs> no, conspiracy theories were, when I wrote the novel in 2012 and 2014, where, among other things, the answer we try to give as societies when we realize that official history has been lying to us. And then I published the novel in 2015, and Donald Trump was elected in 2016, <laughs> and my whole idea about conspiracy theories changed. Yeah. But um, this is, and in Latin America this is particularly true, how uh, when we realize that official history is inaccurate, um, uh, societies, both societies and individuals, tend to produce their own versions of what happened to fill the void. Uh, we human beings are very mysterious. We would, between a lie and no story at all, we will always choose the lie. And this is something that makes us fascinating and really very uh, fallible as, as societies. But. We don't have the choice between a lie and no story at all. Well, uh, we, we if, can make up our own stories, which yes, people do. We, we make up our own stories to fill that void. Yeah. Because when we realize that history is a lie or is imperfect or has been distorted, we don't just say, oh, well, that's that. You know, <laughs> we complete the missing parts hmm. with things about which, which, with stories about which we have uh, not a single shred of evidence. And no way of knowing. And no way of knowing because this is the past, and the past is by definition a story. And because it's a story, it's always, it always has a narrator, and that narrator has uh, an agenda and wants to highlight things and wants to suppress other things. So we are at the mercy of uh, storytellers. Yeah. Do you want to talk a little bit about the narrator of this novel for, for those who Yes. Haven't read it. He's uh, a very nice guy. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's an interesting guy. <laughs> he's called Juan Gabriel Vasquez. And, yes. Um, <laughs> yeah. Why? How? How did uh, you come to this decision? The decision to, to tell the, the novel from the point of view of Juan Gabriel Vasquez, si. yes. Uh, and give him your family history and My family history, and my biography, <laughs> my, yeah. <laughs> Some of my likes and dislikes. Some of them. Um, I, and it, it has a lot to do with the, the, the circumstances in which the novel was born. What I was telling you about, the fact that the novel was born, um, the moment I met this doctor who, who put these uh, human ruins <laughs> in my hands, and this was happening at the same time as my daughters uh, were born, very prematurely they were born at uh, 30 weeks, uh, that's six months and a half. So uh, they, uh, their, their 
their their life wasn't a certain no. wasn't a given. They're they, teeny tiny. Teeny tiny. I mean, one of them weighed one thousand and twenty six grams. <laughs> That's like a big plate of pasta. You know, it's a pasta <laughs> first, for four people. The first time I met you, which was about six months after they were born, yeah. you were telling me, yeah, they were so premature. They were they weighed como un filete. They were like a steak. A steak, yes. <laughs> yes, exactly. Big each. steak. Yes. <laughs> One each. Yeah. Um, so this situation, this... this the, the precarious situation. The, 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 the precariousness of the situation and the fact that I had, and that I was going through this uh, epiphany about Colombian history <laughs> uh, at the same time is the origin of the novel. And the, the situation was so powerful for me that... I thought for some reason, this is the novelist's uh, instinct mm -hmm. speaking, I thought that to invent a narrator, to invent a mask, would in some way undermine the, the potency of, of these events for me. Mm -hmm. um, whereas, uh, since I had personal biographical links to the murder of Gaitan, um, and the novel was born because of this uh, personal uh, troubles I was uh, going through. Yeah. It, putting myself in the line of fire, so to speak, um, as a narrator of the novel would, would make much more sense. Yeah. And so this was the choice. And uh, I ended up um, inventing a character, really, uh, who carries the, the intrigue of the novel forward um, and who asks Juan Gabriel Vasquez, the narrator, to write a particular book because he thinks he has discovered yeah. these revelations about uh, the mysteries in Colombian history. And at the end, you realize it's not uh, exactly that. <laughs> Do you? <laughs> No spoilers, no, no. <laughs> no spoilers. I mean, he dies in the end, but who cares? Uh, no, no, he doesn't die. He doesn't die. No. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Titan dies. Uribe, Gaitan Uribe dies. dies. Yes. And the Titanic sinks. Yeah, the Titanic yes. sinks and um, that other one. <laughs> that other boat. The other boat. In the First World War. The, uh, the Lusitania. The Lusitania. Lusitania, yeah. yeah. Lusitania. Um, Okay, so this is a, a phone-in question from Dundas, Ontario. Okay. <laughs> it's one of these, one of these okay. questions that are actually too long to ask, but quite naturally, because Juan Gabriel is the narrator, at times the novel has literature and writers front of mind. Yeah. Garcia Marquez, Borges, Cortázar, Moreno Duran, and so on. This this novelist wonders if the telling of the story also consciously registers the presence of some of these writers or others. The recounting of Uribe, Uribe's death is a chronicle of a death foretold. The idea of conspiracies forming around assassinations, the details not holding still, is there in Don DeLillo's Libra, for instance? Yes. All these relics of histories that, that won't stay in place, stories of murder and bones of the dead seem to make an argument for the novelist's art. Yes. Novels inclined toward the making of orders, however complex. Is this kind of novel necessary to rescue the past from histories and their variants? Well, that... <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> you can't hear me at all. You wanted to read the question again? <laughs> it's a really long question, but it's about... Uh, it's about um, novels and order, the creation of order, however complex. And this friend of ours, a mutual friend of ours, asks if this kind of novel that Juan has written is necessary, the form is necessary, to rescue the past from histories and their variants. Yeah, it's a, beautiful, it's a beautiful question <laughs> and it's a beautiful idea in which I deeply believe, yes, so the answer is yes, novels are absolutely necessary, I think. Um, not only because the history, we, the, this version of our past that we have received, that we call history, uh, that we have agreed upon, 
is, despite the fact that we have agreed on it, is uh, very frail and, uh, um, and full of dark corners. Um, because the way historiographers write history has its limitations. They, they can only write about what has been proven. Historians, not Historians. Yeah. You don't have that word, historiography? We do, it's yeah. something else. It's something else. Yes. Fascinating. <laughs> okay. Um, so, um, uh, there's this, this uh, German romantic poet, Novalis, who says somewhere that novels arise out of the shortcomings of history. Mm -hmm. Meaning, obviously, that history can only go so far in the telling of the past. To those places, uh, that history cannot reach, um, we go with novels, with fictions, writings of the imagination. Um, without novels, we really wouldn't be able to feel what it was to be, what it was like to be alive during the Napoleonic Wars, for instance, in War and Peace. Um, or um, we, wouldn't, we wouldn't know what it what emotionally, um, personally, uh, it was like to go through, I don't know, the Vietnam War or the consequences of the Vietnam War. Um, so there are corners of our past that are terribly important for our understanding of our world as individuals and as social beings. And we can only reach those corners in fictions. Um, Conrad uh, writes about Henry James somewhere mm -hmm. that novelists are historians of emotions. Uh. And I love that idea. The idea that um, we write, novels write, about places in our soul mm. that are completely inaccessible to any other kind of writing any other kind of storytelling um, cannot explore the emotional life of a human being in the past, or in the present for that matter, but... Short stories uh, can do it. Hmm? Short stories can do it. Well, fiction, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I have this, I have this, this trust in fiction, mm. because I think without, without fiction we... Uh, a whole area of human experience would be inaccessible to us, impossible to, to visit and explore and, and know. This is what novels do. They go to places where um, no other storytelling mode can really go. Uh, places in, in human emotions, in, in that area that we call the human soul. Um, and this is what I try to write about. My novels are not about Colombian history. The Colombian <laughs> they, history is... They do is, have a little bit to do with Colombian well, history. Well, <laughs> it's very important for me. Yeah. But they're not about that. No, they're not historians, about that. Historians they, write about Colombian history. Yeah. Colombian historians or British historians or whoever, they write about history. What I try to write about is the, the impact these events have in the private lives of individuals. Yeah. In individuals as fathers and sons and mothers and lovers and brothers and sisters. How do public events shape our private lives? This is what I have tried to write about in all my novels, and this one is part of that group. <laughs> the longest. And it's the longest, the <laughs> yes. Forever. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I can't ask you that. Is it true that you never asked your great uncle about Caetano and the Bogotazo? <laughs> um, so that relative <laughs> that I was telling you about, uh, who was a politician in, in the 1940s, um, was a great uncle of mine who, um, who had an important role to play in that day, and in the days that followed, um, very dramatic days for people in Bogota. He was, was um, he the governor of the province? He was the governor province. of a province north of Bogota. And so after this politician, uh, Jorge Lesel Gaitan, was murdered, 
there was a popular revolt, um, which ended three days later with 3,000 people killed. Um, and the police uh, was, had been secretly on the side of Gaitan, so they, they, uh, they kind of, uh, uh, what do you call that, they, they rebelled. Uh, rebelled. Yeah, they um. rebelled. And so my uncle sent some of his own police over there in the north to try to control the, the situation of public order, public order situation in the city. Um, so he died when I was 24. And uh, in the novel, I say that I never asked him about um, the murder of Gaitan or his role in, in those days. And as I was translating this, I was thinking, you what? You never yeah. asked him? Yeah, what's wrong with you? How right? can that be true? Yes. Uh, well, no, this is a novel. Yeah. You know, it's, uh, <laughs> so there are some things that are there for the sake of the narrative to, to make the book uh, more... Um, so you did, you discussed it at length? Not at length, no. 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 Uh, I don't know if, it, if you have the same feeling, but I think one of, the, one of the reasons the past is so difficult is that we, we don't have a clear communication with the witnesses of the past. Um, we all have grown up with people who knew these things and we never really get, to, to, we never really get them to talk. Um, and we let people we know, we let them disappear along with their stories. Mm. And this is a source of profound anxiety for me. That it, people right a... now know stories about our past that are disappearing with them. Do and th we let that happen. Do you think it's a generational thing? Do you think like in your 20s you're not interested enough to say yes. Yes, I think. what happened, what really happened? In your 20s you're not really aware that you're a historical being. You don't, yeah. you don't think about that. You don't think you're the product of ages and ages of historical events. Uh, you live in the present and you look to, to the future. Um, this was something Philip Roth used to say, that uh, when they ask him, Philip Roth is one of my favorite novelists, um, when they ask him why this outburst of wonderful novels uh, that he wrote, um, beginning more or less in 1990. Uh, American Pastoral, I Married a Communist, The Human Stain. And he said, well, I became older. Mm. And as you become older, you realize there, there's this history behind you um, that becomes a mysterious place. This is what uh, this novel tries to discuss. That yeah. mis mysterious place in my, um, in my past uh, that I become aware of because I have turned 40 or 40, 40. <laughs> <laughs> barely, barely 40. Barely. <laughs> oh, it was years ago. Yeah. Um, okay, ¿qué más? <laughs> okay. You're in charge of the questions. Come um, on. Um, did you, did you actually say somewhere that the murder of Gaitan created the 20th century for Colombia? No. No? No. I no. Think, I think I, you did. I think you said it on the I CBC. I would have loved to say that. This I think you said it on the CBC to um, Eleanor. That the murder of Gaitan created the 20th century? Yeah. It's a beautiful idea. <laughs> I, 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 but I, it's I, on I, tape. I, think, I can find it. Yeah? <laughs> yeah? No, I don't think it's, it's the truth. But it reminds me of... <laughs> Maybe I wrote it down. Something that we are aware of as Latin Americans, I think. But I think it's true for, for anybody. Uh, the way that, in a sense, our societies um, are created in stories. Uh, what we are is the, the, the consequence of the stories we have told. Um, and this is why it's so important to be aware of who's telling the story. Mm. This is something that, that I heard Salman Rushdie uh, say in public once, uh, maybe 10 years ago. He said, he said, we have to be aware of the question, who has the right to tell our story? Because many powers are competing with each other all the time for the right to 
impose their own version of the past on us. Yeah. Uh, the state, a religion, um, uh, even, even publicity. And now, he didn't say this, but this is what I have been trying to discuss in the lectures, social media. Social media mm -hmm. is the new narrator that is trying to impose a certain story on us. Mm -hmm. And we're letting them get away with it. And it's a very nasty story. Yeah. Because it's manipulated, because it's, it's rigged, because it's... Um, we, we tended to think 10 or 15 years ago that social media was the ultimate place of democracy. <laughs> Right, because it gave voice to people who had never been able to speak, and that's wonderful. And because we had seen how social media was almost single-handedly responsible for uh, the oh. revolution in, Ed in Egypt, and we thought, this is a great thing. Well, some of us. <laughs> but, yeah. Uh, but then it started to change because social media has a business model that is absolutely uninterested in democracy or the common good mm. or whatever. Uh, the reason Facebook is rich and Twitter is rich is because they have learned how to spy on us, gather information about us, and condition our behavior to earn money. And some of that uh, conditioning is is done through news, real or fake, um, and through building small, um, small societies in which like-minded people live with mm. completely unaware that there is something, uh, something as the rest of like the world. Like micro societies. Yeah. So it's breaking up our society. Mm. Why? Because it's imposing different narratives on us. Uh, and we are the characters <laughs> in these novels. And we haven't been able to figure out how to control that. It's, it's really a fascinating thing, and I think this will be the subject of our social conversation for the next 20 years. And it will be the place where we uh, fail or, um, or uh, triumph as societies. Mm. Mm. Fascinating and terrifying. Terrifying, yeah.